Hey everyone, my name's Charlie and I'm going to be doing a video about my like OCD story, which is a pretty crazy story, <laughs> um, but a good one in the end. Um, so I'm just going to get right into it. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about it. So I was, basically the best way to start is I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was four years old, which is Attention Deficit Hyperactive Disorder. Um, and people with ADHD and autism, things like that, are more susceptible to things like OCD and anxiety. But I wasn't showing any signs of that until, any signs of OCD or anxiety until I was about nine years old. And I remember it very vividly. My first thought was, and this is so like late 90s, early 2000s, <laughs> if your PlayStation game I think it was Tekken or something, something like that. <laughs> um, if it doesn't finish loading, um, like you need to run up and down the stairs before your game finishes loading or your whole family will die. So that's kind of how the thought like presented itself like straight on. Like I always say these new intrusive thoughts hit you like a train. Um, so, and I believed it wholeheartedly without any kind of like doubt or anything. And so like, I would like run up and down the stairs, like every time I played this, this game, and obviously my family kind of cottoned onto it and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I told them, I'm like, I need to do this or you, you, you will all die. And then that kind of like turned into like light switching on and off. So these were like physical compulsions. Um, I was already seeing a psychiatrist anyway, because when you have ADHD, um, as a child, you most often see a psychiatrist, especially if you're medicated, which at the time I was. Um, so fortunately we had quite quick access to get some help with what was going on. And the psychiatrist told me and my parents that what I'm having is basically a very common sort of thing that can go alongside ADHD is OCD, intrusive thoughts, physical compulsions and things. And I remember getting some light CBT for that. Obviously when you're only like nine years old, I'm not quite sure the kind of level that they go to, but yeah, um, I remember it kind of nipped it in the bud. I don't remember having it for very long after that. Um, I might have had a bit of anxiety, but there was nothing kind of that really stuck. And then when I became, when I became, when I turned 16 years old, um, I was going through like quite a traumatic year. There was kind of like a lot of family problems and things like that. And that's when it came back. And I definitely think OCD and anxiety can kind of rear their ugly head in puberty. And also obviously it can be triggered by trauma. So I kind of know why, um, why it kind of came around. And it was again kind of harm OCD, um, but instead of physical compulsions, it was more mental this time. So the thought that came to me was, what if I've like put poison in my stepdad's beer? And you, you know, logically you would think, well, where would you get the poison from, blah, blah, blah. I mean, obviously you shouldn't analyze, but that was what I was trying to do. I was like, well, I have no poison. How would that even work? But it was enough. It was enough to kind of set in the new thought, the new kind of OCD pattern that I was going to have and was then going to manifest because, you know, I was kind of doing everything wrong. So when that thought came along, it then manifested to me like from there, literally from that very second and not being able to prepare people's foods. I couldn't really be in the same room with other people's food if they weren't also in the room in case I like poisoned it. It was always poison. I was never sure what poison, but if anything, like a show came on, you know, like a detective show where you would see like the spy put the powder in the drink, that was a huge trigger for me. I couldn't, I couldn't watch anything like that. Um, but yeah, it like I couldn't. I stopped preparing food for like them, my family, because I was so afraid that I was going to kill them and I would go to prison. And it was this whole thing. And then eventually, quite quickly, I think that manifested to suicidal OCD, which, so I had that alongside harm OCD because my brain was like, oh, well, you can't live with this. How can anyone live with this? It's horrible. Um, what if you're gonna like poison yourself or kill yourself? And I was never actually suicidal. Um, I think it's important to kind of, you know, be clear about that. I, I was never actually suicidal, but my OCD was kind of saying, yes, you are. <laughs> um, so then I wasn't able to prepare food for myself 
or drinks for myself. Um, even opening a packet of crisps at times could be difficult. And that then manifested into a fear of pills. So um, for, for a couple of, like I had a couple of triggers and suddenly I was now afraid of pills. So I was afraid that I was putting pills in other people's food and putting pills in my food so that I would then overdose. So then I couldn't really eat food that looked like pills either. You know, at the end of the day, I still had to eat regardless of how terrified I was of like poisoning or whatever. I still had to eat, but I was now cutting out food that I look, that I thought looked like pills. For example, like Skittles, even cereal. It got to a point with cereal as well. And with every single bit of food I ate, I would always leave a piece, like, you know, with a chip, I would leave like the end of a chip or something to prove that that was what I had eaten and not a pill. Um, and yeah, so that then manifested, and this wasn't 24 seven that I was doing this, but I became, I had, I developed a fear of swallowing. Um, I was worried I was going to, uh, that what I was swallowing wasn't like saliva, it was pills. Um, and the, I would, I noticed that my, these intrusive thoughts and things like that would always happen predominantly in the evening. So it was easier to eat in the morning or eat in the afternoon. Um, at school, great. Um, when I was at like college, um, it was an excellent distraction for me. I, it almost felt like OCD wasn't even a thing in, in, in college. Um, it was like a safe space for me because I knew it couldn't get me there, you know? Um, so it was easier to eat maybe more challenging pill looking foods. Um, I still really struggled, but it was easier. Um, but the swallowing thing mainly happened at night. So I like, I, it, it sounds kind of gross, but I would sometimes have to like spit out my saliva because I was convinced it was like pills. Um, so naturally, as a result of this, I lost a lot of weight as well I went from like well, I lost a stone anyway I lost about 12 pounds in the space of gosh it must have been like six months so a stone probably less and I was already a healthy weight I was like um a size a UK size eight which is um you know slim and healthy um and I dropped to a UK size six to four um so losing a stone in weight when you're already slim is especially in such a short time frame is pretty dramatic very dramatic and um, so I became very thin and that then manifested, <laughs> we're, all, we're, we're going through a whole shebang, <laughs> um, it manifested into an eating disorder. Um, not like a severe one, it was more, I just wanted some kind of escape or I wanted to use the eating disorder as a form of control for what was going on. It felt like if I could at least control what was going in my body, then you know, like I couldn't control the thoughts, I couldn't control how I was reacting to them. I can control my diet. You know, I was getting compliments about how, oh, wow, you look so skinny, you look so good. Um, that that made me feel good, you know? Uh, so I was like, okay, well, that's one thing I've got going for me, you know? Um, so, you know, during this sort of chaotic time with my OCD manifesting and this eating disorder sort of coming in um, and the sort of the family chaos that was going on around me, um, obviously, I, it, during these times, I had pretty much let my parents know what was going on. I didn't really keep it secret and I think that was a key to my recovery as well, not keeping this secret. So I uh, was referred to cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, uh, which is what I had when I was nine years old, but obviously I didn't really remember the treatment or anything um, back then. So um, I got like home visits from a cognitive behavioural specialist and it did really help. It was extremely challenging though. Um, extremely challenging obviously um for most people i'm sure who've seen this video will, will have either had cognitive behavioral therapy or know what it is um so you're like forced to basically do your exposures and you know you 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 get help working through them quite closely and it did work um and it did really help me um but unfortunately so that this is where I sort of what went wrong, where a lot of people go wrong, is they think, oh, I've had my cognitive behavioural therapy, it's working, and OCD's gone now, it's not going to come back. Um, but of course, what I didn't know then, and what I know now is, you know, OCD very much becomes kind of, weirdly kind of a safe, it's like a habit, but it's it feels very safe. Um, it's kind of like a coping mechanism in a way, so it's actually really hard for your brain to unlearn these habits, especially when 
you know, people with OCD are more likely to be predisposed to it. You know, we're more likely to have these these compulsive behaviours. So our brain is kind of wired slightly differently. So untraining that and relearning that, you know, retraining your brain is hard and a process. And it isn't just a few rounds of CBT and boom, you're done. You know, it's, you need constant refreshing. But again, I didn't know this and the therapist, you know, these therapists that mean well and do so much, I don't think they fully know this either, you know, what they're taught. I don't think they fully know that, um, in my opinion anyway, I could be wrong. Um, so, you know, it would come back um, and go away. It was always around harm OCD and um, suicidal OCD, you know, the fear of pills kind of stuck, but the eating, I could eat all kinds of food again, um, luckily. And, you know, the eating disorder remained mild. Um, it never became severe, fortunately, um, but I was still, you know, remained quite slim. Um, so from there, I started taking medication for my anxiety and OCD, um, at around the age of 21, I think. And I started on, um, citalopram, which really helps with the panic attacks, um, that I was getting as a result of these intrusive thoughts. Um, I then went from citalopram to sertraline, which I still take now. Um, and, um, it's amazing. Um, it's really, really good actually, um, cause the panic attacks were starting to like die off. Um, I think by this point I'd had about three rounds of cognitive behavioral therapy and I was feeling that frustration as well. I was feeling frustrated. So I was like, why do I need more? You know, I was questioning it. I was over analyzing it, which you're not meant to do. I was like, why do I need more? Like, aren't I fixed now? Aren't I done now? Like this time I have, you know, the means. But when I came out of this cognitive behavioral therapy, I was then very reliant on my medication. I was like, okay, well, I don't have to do any, any more things now. I just take my medication and I'll just try and remember what the CBT person said. And that unfortunately isn't quite how it works. You kind of have to be, you know, consistent. Um, so eventually I then had some trauma therapy, um, which helped me get into the process of acceptance. But my, um, my sort of downfall was that I was hoping that getting trauma therapy would help finally nip these intrusive thoughts in the bud. I was like, okay, well, if I can uncover these, you know, difficult things in my childhood, if I can finally come to terms with that, then my OCD will just magically go away because a lot of my triggers were as a result of some kind of traumatic situation. So I was like, it'll just fix everything, which was quite, naive so <laughs> yeah i had that in my when or how old would i have been mid 20s i think i'm 30 now so yeah about 25 26 maybe i had that um and it partly helped partly didn't but um the game changer for me for sure was around that same time so maybe it was when i was around 26 27 yeah, 26, I think, yeah. Yeah, it would have been 26. Um, is when I started to look into, like, I wanted more. I wanted more from this recovery. Um, and I found um, two YouTube channels. One, OCD Recovery, which is, you know, the one, this one. Because not only was it instant access to correct resources to... Um, everything you sort of needed it was also well OCD recovery in particular there was more there wasn't just you know aspects of cognitive behavioral therapy there was way more than what I'd ever been told in CBT or what medica medication could ever do um it was talking you know it went right into detail about everything and if I explained it all in this video it'd be very long so obviously they'll you know you can there's loads of videos about like what I learned, but basically it was more in depth about acceptance and, um, you know, unconditional acceptance in all forms and Albert Ellis, um, learning about him and stuff. And it was just, it was learning about your brain basically and why your brain does this and how it works and really getting into it, like becoming your own expert. And I think, you know, because what really was an eye opener for me when I had my last sort of therapy session, he said, you at this point um, know more about OCD and anxiety than I do. He's like, there is 
like you you have all the information now and that was both helpful and kind of frustrating because I was like but I don't think I'm done there is more like is this all you you can tell me you can teach me kind of thing like I knew there was more and I'm glad that I went on YouTube and I found more and it was the game changer it wasn't just breaking down these patterns it was learning how to stop them forever kind of thing but um yeah so that that was the game changer and alongside you know watching these videos um on OCD recovery I would also then you know sort of like that they have a Facebook group um OCD recovery has like um a list of books and the books changed everything I now tell everyone about the books I'm still reading the books to this day and from there I learned about acceptance and inner peace and mindfulness which sounds so kind of kooky to some people but to me it was like you know like even learning about Buddhism and you don't have to be a Buddhist to learn about Buddhism although I like to think I'm I don't know I'm not a Buddhist but I, I, I dabble I dabble <laughs> um but it was just learning about you know accepting all those emotions all the feelings accepting the suffering uh which sounds kind of bad but it's not yeah um, and just learning about inner peace and being at peace with yourself and being present because OCD anxiety is very much the what ifs or the what have beens and you just being in the moment um, so yeah even learning about Buddhism doesn't even matter if you're you know what religion you are um, Buddhist teachings really really helped in my recovery um, a man called Eckhart Tolle um, he's a very well known spiritualist philosopher something like that um, you know, some people love him, some people hate him, I suppose, I don't know, um, but he was really, really helpful. He has YouTube videos, free audiobooks, you know, you can access all of his stuff on YouTube these days and Spotify. Um, so I loved what he taught too, um, so that really, really helped me. And obviously, like I said previously, I'm still on Search Link, that really helps me. Um, because I'm now at a point where I, I always say I'm like 90% recovered. Um, I think, you know, that search, that desperation to be completely recovered and to never let it, intrusive thoughts bother you ever again. I don't think, you know, you don't need to set that goal. Um, if you set that goal, you're causing pressure, you're causing, you know, you know, you can make recovery an obsession in its own. Um, so for me, like 90%, I'm majority of the time living a very I don't want to say normal but yeah like I, I'm I'm living as if OCD isn't even a thing in my life anymore now and again do I get intrusive thought that unsettles me a bit yes does it bother me for weeks or months or on end and does it manifest into something else and start the ball rolling no not at all now do I get panic attacks no they literally like they, it's like my brain can't even allow them to come through anymore. It's amazing, um, eye-opening. Um, I just they can't they can't come through. Um, it's yeah. So um, the place I'm in now is like incredible. I just want to shout about it all the time. I just want to tell everyone you don't have to be like this forever. You don't have to be trapped in your own mind. And I feel like if I can come from where I came from. And, you know, the the stuff that I've kind of been through and can, you know, be in this amazing, peaceful place in my life with, you know, every everything sort of going for me, amazing family, amazing job, like everything, then it's possible for everybody. So, yeah, I'm in an amazing place right now. And, you know, I would love to talk more about kind of what what I've done. And yeah. Um, but I hope, I hope this was sort of helpful in any way and, um, you know, knowing my OCD journey, cause it's been a long one, you know, from the age of nine to, well, I say 27 was when, when things really started to change, but yeah, that's a long, long time. Um, but yes, uh, thank you for watching. <laughs> Bye.